Live from New Delhi, you're watching DD India Live, India's voice to the world. I'm Siddharth Bharadwaj. Coming up in the next 30 minutes. Six people presumed dead in Baltimore bridge collapse. Traffic in port suspended till further notice. Biden says federal government will fund bridge rebuild. Israel claims UN ceasefire calls hindered negotiations with Hamas even as fighting continues in Gaza. Qatar says talks underway between Israeli and Hamas representatives via mediators in Doha aimed at ending the fighting. Independent candidate Robert F. Kennedy Jr. taps tech lawyer Nicole Shanahan as his U.S. vice presidential pick. Shanahan brings potential financial firepower and tech industry connections to Kennedy's ticket. Last day of nominations for first phase of India's general elections. 102 constituencies across 21 states will go to polls on April 19. A major bridge in Baltimore collapsed after being hit by a freighter on Tuesday. Two people were rescued and the remaining six are presumed dead, officials said on Tuesday evening. Authorities are transitioning from a search and rescue operation to a recovery effort. And assure the safety of those divers and the rescue personnel that are going to participate in this. If we look at how, how challenging it is at a simple motor vehicle crash to extract an individual, I'm sure we can all imagine how much harder it is to do it in climate weather, when it's cold, under the water, with very limited to no visibility. Maryland Governor Wes Moore declared a state of emergency while also thanking those who are carrying out search and rescue operations. There's going to be a long road. There's going to be a long road, not just as we go from search and rescue. There'll be a long road as we talk about what does the future of this region, the future of the area look like. And we're going to need each, each and every one of you. Well, U.S. Secretary of Transportation said the rebuilding after the collapse of the Francis Scott Key Bridge in Baltimore, Maryland, will not be easy. And as President Biden has made clear, the federal government will provide all of the support that they need for as long as it takes. This is no ordinary bridge. This is one of the cathedrals of American infrastructure. It has been part of the skyline of this region for longer than many of us have been alive. So the path to normalcy will not be easy. It will not be quick. It will not be inexpensive. But we will rebuild together. Shocking footage revealed the moment the bridge's steel arcs disintegrated and plunged into Patapsco River. The vessel appears to have crashed into one of the supports of the Francis Scott Key Bridge. The ship caught fire and thick black smoke billowed out of it. Parts of the collapsed four-lane bridge in the U.S. port of Baltimore were lying across the hull of the Dali container ship after it smashed into a pylon hours earlier. U.S. President Joe Biden has convened a meeting with the senior members taking a brief on the collapse of Baltimore's Francis Scott Key Bridge. In the meeting, U.S. President has directed administration to ensure every federal resource available to response to this terrible incident. Attention that the federal government will pay for the entire cost of reconstructing that bridge. And I expect to, the Congress to support my effort. This is going to take some time. The people of Baltimore can count on us, though to stick with them at every step of the way until the port is reopened and the bridge is rebuilt. 
India extended its condolences to all the affected in the Baltimore Bridge collapse incident, putting it on social media platform X. A heartfelt condolences to all affected by the unfortunate incident an accident at the Francis Scott Key Bridge in Baltimore. For any Indian citizens that may be affected require assistance, the Embassy of India has created a dedicated hotline. Please, please reach out to us on plus one two zero two seven one seven one nine nine six. Israel has claimed that UN ceasefire calls hindered negotiations with Hamas. It said Hamas's rejection of a current proposal for a Gaza truce deal with Israel shows the damage done by the UN Security Council resolution demanding an immediate ceasefire. Hamas on Tuesday put out a statement rejecting the latest truce plan put forward by mediators from US, Qatar and Egypt at indirect talks in Doha. The group said it was sticking to its original demands for a permanent ceasefire that would lead to a full withdrawal of Israeli forces from Gaza and the return of displaced Palestinians to their homes. The Israeli Prime Minister's office said Hamas's stance clearly demonstrates its utter disinterest in a negotiation deal and attests to the damage done by the UN Security Council's resolution. Netanyahu's office further said Israel would not surrender to what it called the Palestinian armed group's delusional demands. The United States on Tuesday said that Israel's assertion that the UN Security Council resolution calling for an immediate ceasefire between Israel and Hamas obstructs hostage negotiations is inaccurate and unfair. That statement, um, which I, I believe said that Hamas pulled out of the hostage talks or Hamas rejected the most recent proposal because of the United Nations Security Council resolution. That statement is inaccurate uh, in almost every respect and it is unfair to the hostages and their families. Qatar has meanwhile said that talks are underway between Israeli and Hamas representatives via mediators in Doha aimed at ending the fighting. Qatar Foreign Ministry spokesperson Majid Al Ansari said on Tuesday that the United Nations Security Council resolution calling for an immediate ceasefire between Israel and Hamas in Gaza has not had an immediate impact on ceasefire talks in Doha. We haven't seen any immediate effect on the uh, on the talks. Uh, they are, as I said, they are uh, ongoing as they were uh, before uh, uh, this decision was uh, taking place. Other statements, you know, that came out. Uh, from the uh, Israeli government are, you know, bilaterally between the U.S. and uh, Israel and they have not affected the talks as we speak right now. And protests continue in Israel for the immediate and safe release of hostages held by Hamas terrorists in Gaza. In Tel Aviv, a crowd of hostage families and their supporters gathered outside the Israeli defense headquarters on Tuesday demanding a deal be made as soon as possible to release their loved ones. Some locked themselves into cages in protest, while others held up photos of their loved ones. U.S. presidential candidate Robert F. Kennedy Jr. has announced Silicon Valley lawyer and philanthropist Nicole Shanahan as his running mate. Kennedy named Shanahan the ex-wife of Google co-founder Sergey Brin at a campaign event that included attacks on the pharmaceutical industry and COVID lockdowns. With the choice, Kennedy bypassed better-known potential candidates including National Football League star Aaron Rodgers. Kennedy is bagged by 15% of registered voters versus 39% for Biden and 38% for Trump. The Democratic National Committee and many political strategists say Kennedy's campaign could be a spoiler in the 2024 election that would help elect Trump. Venezuelan opposition leader Maria Corina Machado confirmed that she will remain on the electoral path to the Venezuelan presidential elections on July 28. However, Machado did not explain how she would do this given the inability of her party, Democratic Unity Platform, to register its new candidate, Corina Yores. Yores was chosen on Friday following the disqualification of Machado from running for public office and elections until 2036. The registration period for presidential candidates began on March 19 and ended on March 25th. Machado has faced increasing political repression from the government of President Nicolas Maduro, which has accused her of having links to an alleged anti-government plot. 
Another opposition candidate, the governor of Zulia state, Manuel Rosales, said that it is committed to the electoral path even under the worst conditions and rejected the option for abstention. Now, thousands of people protested in Budapest near Parliament on Tuesday, demanding the Chief Prosecutor and Prime Minister Viktor Orban resign after former government inside accused a senior aide to Orban of trying interfere in graft case. Protesters marched from the Chief Prosecutor's office towards Parliament. Peter Maguire earlier published a recording of conversation with Judith Varga, then his wife and Hungary's Justice Minister, in which she detailed an attempt to remove certain parts from document in graft case. The case is centered on former Justice Ministry State Secretary Pal Wallner, who was charged in 2022 with accepting bribes. Both have pleaded not guilty. Prosecutors are seeking jail terms for the pair. Prosecutors said in a statement they would analyze the tape and further evidence would be collected. Ukraine's President Volodymyr Zelensky has replaced the top security official in new reshuffle on Tuesday. The Ukrainian president dismissed Oleksiy Danilov, Secretary of Ukraine's National Security and Defense Council, and replaced him with Alexander as Chief of Foreign Intelligence, according to decrees published on the presidential website. Oleksiy Danilov, the outgoing Secretary of the National Security and Defense Council, had held his position since October 2019, just months after Zelensky took office. Zelensky, speaking later in his nightly video address, said Danilov was being transferred to new duties and said that the strengthening of Ukraine and the renewal of the state system in all sectors will continue. I appointed Alexander Litvinenko as the new secretary of the National Security Council. He will combine his experience of leading the Foreign Intelligence Service with the task facing the National Security and Defense Council of Ukraine. In general, I expect the strengthening of the strategic capabilities of our state to predict and influence the processes on which the national security of our state depends. An Ukrainian railway supplied warm meals to Kharkiv residents on Tuesday as much of the eastern city has rolling power blackouts after Russian strikes hit energy infrastructure. The attacks, the biggest of which came on Friday, have caused major damage to generating and transmission facilities. In the northeastern border of Kharkiv and parts of southeastern Jeparidza region, 200,000 residents have gone without electricity since last Friday's attacks. The European Union's agricultural ministers have discussed scrutinizing imports and cutting the bureaucratic burden on farmers at a meeting in Brussels. While ministers discussed relief, hundreds of tractors blocked the streets of Brussels as agitations over the bloc's policies continue. Our correspondent Ishan Garg has more. The pressure on EU officials is rising as farmers' protests continue across Europe. Many are protesting against a series of EU policies, including new sustainable farming laws and import rules. The farmers say despite some concessions, their demands haven't been met. The EU is now monitoring the price of agricultural products. But farmers say they want a law that guarantees them a sale price above their cost of production. These demonstrations are also targeting the EU's trade practices, especially the bloc's free trade agreements like the one it's currently negotiating with Latin American countries including Brazil and Argentina. The EU has agreed to impose some restrictions on the import of Ukrainian goods, but the farmers say it doesn't go far enough. They argue their profits have been hit at a time when many of them are struggling due to rising costs of farming. Officials have agreed to reduce red tape and water down some of their environmental regulations to help farmers, but all of that has failed to quell the farmers' anger. That's why for the third time this year, hundreds of tractors rolled onto Brussels Street. Though the demonstrations on Tuesday were smaller than previous ones, farming groups say it shows their desperation. They say they want to keep the pressure up and get more concessions from officials. The Belgian agricultural minister says the bloc is working on offering concrete solutions to the farmers. There are concerns in Brussels about the farmers' movement being capitalized on by right-wing groups in the upcoming European Parliament elections in June. And that is why officials are hoping to pacify the protesters before then. Ishan Garg in The Hague, reporting for DD India. 
Belgian farmers jammed Brussels' European Union district with about 250 tractors on Tuesday ahead of the meeting of the bloc's agriculture ministers. Protesters poured dirt through beets and sprayed manure with pulleys answered with water cannons and tear gas at the protest. The farmers say more should be done to ensure fair prices and move away from export-oriented free trade agreements. EU members are debating how to grant Ukraine a further year-long extension of tariff-free access to its markets while also placating farmers who have protested for months. Spokesperson of Belgian Farmers Union Fugia said the protests intends also to send a message to society in the light of upcoming European elections in June. And still to come on this edition of DD Inda Live. Election Commission of India deploys resources to educate every Indian voter as Lok Sabha polls approaches near. Shivam Dubey, Rachin Ravindra stars in CSK's takedown of Gujarat Titans in a repeat of last year's IPL final. And Sunil Chetri's 150th game for India ends in loss as they slump to 1 2 defeat to Afghanistan at home in FIFA World Cup 2026 qualifiers. Voice of a rising aspirational world. Stories of challenges, struggles, and accomplishments. A world battling conflict, hunger and poverty. Embracing growth, development, science and technology. A voice of progress, a voice of unity. Watch Voice of the Global South with me, Akshay Dongre, only on DD India. You are watching DD India Live, I am Siddharth Bharadwaj. Let's get you the latest on what's happening in India in the run-up to the world's largest democratic election. Today is the last day for filing nominations for the first phase of polls for India's lower house of parliament. The elections will be held for 102 parliamentary seats in 17 states and four union territories in the first phase. 39 seats of Tamil Nadu, 12 seats of Rajasthan, 8 seats of Uttar Pradesh, 6 seats of Madhya Pradesh, 5 seats each in Uttarakhand, Assam and Maharashtra, 4 seats of Bihar, 3 seats of West Bengal, 2 seats each in Arunachal Pradesh, Manipur, Meghalaya and 1 seat each in Chhattisgarh, Mizoram, Nagaland, Sikkim. Tripura, Andaman and Nicobar Islands, Jammu and Kashmir, Lakshadweep and Puducherry will go to the polls in first phase. And the BJP has released the list of 40 star campaigners for Madhya Pradesh in the run-up to the Lok Sabha elections. Prime Minister Narendra Modi, Party Chief J.P. Nadda, Union Ministers Amit Shah, Rajnath Singh, Nitin Gadkari, Jyoti Raditya Sindhya and Smriti Irani. Chief Ministers Mohan Yadav, Madhya Pradesh, Yogi Adityanath, Uttar Pradesh, Himanta Biswa Sarma, Assam, Vishnu Deo Sai, Chhattisgarh and Bhajan Lal Sharma, Rajasthan and former Madhya Pradesh Chief Minister Shivrat Singh Chauhan are among the star campaigners for the party. Well, the Congress party unveiled its seventh list of candidates for the upcoming parliamentary elections. The list includes four names for Indian state of Chhattisgarh and one from India's southern state of Tamil Nadu. The four Congress candidates from Chhattisgarh are Devinder Singh Yadav from Bilaspur, Biresh Thakur from Kankar, Shashi Singh from Surguja and Dr. Menka Devi Singh from Raigarh. While for Tamil Nadu, advocate R. Sudha has been fielded from Maila Dutrai. Senior BJP leader and India's Union Minister Nitin Gadkari is seeking his third term for India's lower house of parliament. He will contest polls from Nagpur constituency in Indian state of Maharashtra. Congress party has fielded Nagpur West MLA Vikas Thakre as candidate from Nagpur constituency. In the first phase, Nagpur Gachiroli Chimur 
Bandara, Gondia, Chandrapur and Ramtek will go to polls in Maharashtra. Voter awareness programs play a key role during elections. It aims to guarantee that individuals are aware of their right to vote and that they use it responsibly. Here's a report. ये सिर्फ निशान नहीं, शान है। लोकतंत्र में हमारा भी योगदान है। मेरा वोट, मेरी ड्यूटी। मेरा वोट, मेरी ड्यूटी। The Election Commission of India has the mandate to conduct elections to the various assemblies as well as the Parliament of the nation. The task is much more than just the logistical preparation for the voting process. In fact, the ECI spends a considerable amount of time and attention to educate the voters for their rights. Various campaigns are launched regularly to evoke the spirit of democracy and the power of one vote. On the National Voters' Day on 25th January, ECI launched a national level multimedia campaign to educate and raise awareness among voters for the upcoming 18th general elections to the lower house of the Indian Parliament. Titled Chunav Ka Parv, Desh Ka Garv or Elections, the biggest festival and pride of the nation. The campaign underscores the significance of elections as not only the largest celebration of democracy but also as a source of pride for individuals and the entire nation. <laughs> to fuel the spirit of voting even more, an anthem was also released by the Election Commission of India's Systematic Voters Education and Electoral Participation or SWEEP program to enhance participation from all categories of voters under the organization's motto, No Voter to be Left Behind. Voter education and awareness is an essential part of the electoral process. The ECI aims to make voters aware of the power of a vote. Also, the Commission tries to inculcate a sense of belonging and ownership with the voters. It has striven to drive home the point that their participation in the election is crucial in order to guarantee a responsible, responsive and democratically elected government. Voter awareness involves electoral as well as civic education. The key aspects covered are election process, political parties and their manifestos, antecedents of candidates. Many educational institutions and organizations hold different activities like sporting events, essay writing contests, poster making competitions, marathons, etc. to raise awareness among people about voting. Various awareness efforts make the electoral process a national festival of celebrating one's choice and every citizen's understanding of their right as voters. Bureau Report, DD India. India's Prime Minister Narendra Modi had a telephone conversation with Prime Minister of Belgium Alexander de Croo. PM Modi congratulated his Belgian counterpart on recent successful hosting of the first nuclear energy summit in Brussels. Both leaders reviewed the excellent relations between India and Belgium. They discussed ways to further strengthen the bilateral partnership in diverse sectors, including trade, investment, clean technologies, semiconductors, pharmaceuticals, green hydrogen, IT, defense, ports, among the others. The two leaders affirmed a commitment to further bolster the India-EU strategic partnership under the ongoing Belgian presidency of the Council of the European Union. On to sports now. In Indian Premier League, Chennai Super Kings produced a clinical display to outwit Gujarat Titans by 63 runs in their IPL match on Tuesday. Asked to take set target, CSK dished out a solid batting display to post a challenging 206 for 6. In response, GT could manage just 143 for 8 in their allotted 20 overs. Shivam Dubey smashed a quick-fire 50, while CSK captain Rutaraj Gaikwad and Rachin Ravindra made crucial contributions. 
Deepak Chahar, Mustafizur Rahman and Tushar Deshpande took two wickets apiece as Chennai Super Kings made it two wins out of two. And Sunil Chetri's 150th game for India ends in loss as India were beaten by Afghanistan in second round FIFA World Cup 2026 qualifiers at Indira Gandhi Athletic Stadium in Guwahati on Tuesday. Captain Sunil Chetri's 150th international game went in vain as the Blue Tigers conceded the match despite leading for quite some time. The loss to a second string Afghanistan had a significant effect on the table and India's chances to progress to the third round of Asian qualification process for the upcoming FIFA World Cup. Giant monsters Kong and Godzilla are back in a new movie titled Godzilla x Kong, The New Empire. After 2021's Godzilla vs Kong, the movie sees the return of the two titans, not as adversaries, but allies. That's all for this edition of DD India Live, but let us know your thoughts on the news of the day. You can connect with us on Facebook, X formerly known as Twitter and Instagram. We'll be back with more news at his break here on DD India. I'm Siddharth Bharadwaj from all of us here in Delhi. Thanks for watching DD India Live.